Hey, so hyper aware that I owe you all a blog, but here's the thing. It's a beautiful day in the city of London, and I thought we'd have class outside. Uh, so what we are doing today is we are hanging out at one of the last extant parts of the city wall of medieval London, which is here in uh, the salubrious confines of the Barbican. Uh, ordinarily, this is not open to the rest of the public, but you're with me. I get you in. Uh, if you want, you can come have a look at this by going to Wallside High Walk or St. Giles Terrace. But uh, here we go. So, as you can see from the wall here and the fact that we're at the Barbican, uh, this has to do with the fact that all medieval cities had city walls. Um, it's actually one of the things that makes something a city in the medieval period, and it's part of what uh, lame ass historians like me call the Criterion Bundle. Uh, there's a certain number of things that a city has to do in order for us to consider it to be a city. It's got to have a wall. It's got to have a cathedral. It's got to have a diverse economy, which means it's got, you know, more than one thing going on. It's not just a market town. It's not just somewhere that's producing, you know, one particular trade good. It's a place that people come to do things. It's got administrative functions. It's got all of those things. And obviously, London's got all of those, plus the cathedral, which really, really makes something a city instead of just a town. Okay. So the Barbican in particular as an area is named after an actual Barbican. What's a Barbican? A Barbican is kind of like the medieval city wall equivalent of like an airlock on a spaceship. So if you picture a city wall like the one we have here and in the middle of it, there's two gates on both sides. So if someone wants to come into the city, they will raise one gate, the people go into the middle, and that gate is lowered behind them, and then they can be checked to see if, you know, they've got weapons, anything like that, or if they've got trade goods, they can then be taxed on those goods when they come into the wall, yeah? Okay, so that's what was here in this particular part of London. Now, you know, there's just like a brutalist masterpiece, which we are gonna take. So that's what this part of London did, and that's what this city wall did in particular. The London city wall is also cool just because it also is built on the old Roman walls. That's super, super normal for medieval people. So medieval people, you know, have a hard on for Romans, much like we have a hard on for Romans now. And that's because, you know, partially, they think of the world as having been more perfect in the ancient world, like Sarah Obergstraddle told us the other week um, in her thing about Q and uh, QAnon. Go read that if you haven't. So basically, they're saying they're always trying to get back to this part of the world and this part of time when things were more perfect. So if you want to give something relevance or you want to give it credence, you attach it to kind of Roman things. Like that's what the Holy Roman Empire does. That's what the Roman Catholic Church does. And in cities, you know, you build your city wall on the old Roman city wall. And that means that your, your city's got real power. It's really connected to like the ancient history of the world. In London, it's not just the wall that does this. Uh, the Guildhall, which is just around the corner from here, does this. It builds over the old Roman amphitheater. Uh, Leadenhall Market, over near Liverpool Street, does this by building over an old forum. And so there's definitely like a callback to the fact that saying, okay, London's always been important. It's historically important. It's a really big thing. But I mean, also partially, it's just like smart because <laughs> you can rebuild building materials. You don't have to just like, a, start completely from scratch. So, I mean, part of it is definitely symbolic, but also, you know, there's some realness in there too. And city walls, you know, you and I might go, well, why does a city have a wall? And the answer is, you know, shit just got attacked more in the medieval period. London gets attacked all the time. Um, just off the top of my head, you know, it's attacked in 1014 by the Danes. Um, it gets attacked by the French uh, during the uh, Hundred Years' War. Of course, it's attacked by the Normans when the Normans take over. Um, it's attacked by White Watt Tyler and the peasants during the Peasants' Rebellion, um, which, you know, yes, comrades, we stand. Uh, so it's attacked repeatedly. So it isn't just about, like, taxing trade goods when they come into a city. You are trying to keep people out and stop them from attacking you. So that's what that's about. The other thing that it does is it helps to kind of define who a community is, right? So like we're always talking about sex work on the blog and about the fact that sex workers have to usually stay inside either very, very close to the city walls if they're gonna be inside of a city or they have to be outside of a city wall, right? So here in London, most sex workers in the medieval period are working at the Bankside Stews, which is kind of like down between what is now Blackfriars and the London Bridge. 
And so that's where they stay because they're outside of the city walls. So you can say, okay, well, they're not part of the community. They are not a part of the city of London. They live outside the walls. So that's how, like, you kind of get around the fact that, you know, yeah, you can be a sex worker, but people don't really like it. When Henry VIII in the early modern period abolishes the stews, which he does, the sex workers kind of move into the city, but then they stay close to the city walls. So here in London, uh, they work at Love Lane, which is just around the corner near Guildhall. They work at Cock Lane, which is out, like right at the barriers of the city walls near uh, near the uh, Golden Boy and near Smithfield Market. Um, and they also work at Grope Cunt Lane, which no longer exists, unfortunately. Uh, Grope Cunt was a very common name for places that sex workers worked, uh, you know, just because it does what it says on the tin. So, you know, there's a way where walls kind of tell you who's a part of a community and who's not because of who gets to be inside of it, or even if they are inside of it, where they get to be. And it's not just about sex workers either. It's also about people like lepers, okay? So there's a lot of lepers in the medieval period, and, you know, it's just one of those things. And they become this sort of symbolic thing where people who want to give to charity or want to show that they're doing something holy will establish what are called lazar houses. And lazar houses, like, you know, brothels, are not usually inside cities, okay? They're going to be outside of a city wall. And that's definitely true here in London as well. Um, the big lazar house was not actually over here by the Barbican. It was over in the west near a church called St. Giles in the Fields. And it was sort of in between Westminster, which was a different city at the time, and London here. So... We used to kind of think that what Lazar Houses were doing was saying, okay, well, lepers are not a part of the community. They have to be outside of the community. And that it was sort of protecting people from contagion. Because even if medieval people don't know about germs, they had an idea of contagion. They knew that you could pick things up. So you would want to keep the lepers outside. But recently, uh, we are rethinking that idea, especially with the help of the scholar Carol Rawcliffe, who has shown that actually one of the reasons why Lazar Houses exist outside the city is so that the donors can kind of like get the kudos for that. And everyone coming in and out of the city will see their big Lazar House that they set up as a charity. So it's not just about excluding lepers from a community. It's about showing the lepers as a kind of form of advertisement for the donors. Now, the thing about this is, is although that doesn't mean that lepers are excluded from a community, what it does say is that lepers are kind of like an object that gets to be used as a form of propaganda for donors. So even if it's a slightly more cuddly story, we're not just saying, oh, lepers can't be in London. What it is saying to us is that lepers can be used however they need to be by rich people for the uses of rich people, right? So even then, when you're outside of a city, there is a kind of like a depersonalization and dehumanization that goes along with that. Yeah, it's not always the most exciting story, but it is what it is. So whenever you see a city wall, which you will, in most medieval cities, even as if it's been torn down, you know, sometimes there are still these little bibs and bobs. Uh, come look at the one in London and think about what it means in terms of the physicality of who gets to be a Londoner and who gets to be a part of it, but also what that means symbolically and how we still kind of use this to delineate our communities now. Yeah. Anyway, it's a gorgeous day. Go have a beer.